Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Mexican Swinton Astronomical Society. <clears throat> Tonight, we welcome Ben Coley from uh, South Africa. He is a UK citizen, so we'll let him off a little bit. Um, but he's been living in South Africa for about around 15 years now. He worked as a field guide in the safari industry. And whilst he still does occasional guiding work, he runs an astro tourism company on a full time basis, although his summer weather makes it rather seasonal in nature, which will be reflected in tonight's talk as he couldn't do exactly what he was wanting to do. Um, he offers visual evenings or night sky safaris, astrophotography tuition and guide training for the lodgers. He also does some virtual stargazing with a Nikon DSLR attached to a Mead LX200 10 inch OTA and the Celestron CGM DX EQ mount. So please put your hands together and welcome Ben Cole. Thank you. Silent applause, muted applause, like it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, yeah, it's not the sort of thing I normally do. So you'll have to forgive me if I fumble around a little bit. Um, but yes, I'm delighted to, to give you guys a little bit of background about myself. And more importantly, from my point of view, what I have been trying to do over here in South Africa for the last uh, couple of years. So I think um, rather than me sort of chit chat too much. I think we'll just go straight into the presentation and hopefully that will have some sort of flow. What I'd like to do is just sort of give you a little bit of history about myself and how I ended up doing what I'm doing. A little bit of information about uh, what I say, what I'm trying to achieve out here, particularly in terms of raising awareness of stargazing and astronomy in terms of uh, to the local communities in South Africa, particularly because it's where my sort of heart and my experience lies within the, as we call the bush, uh, sort of within the safari industry and the tourism industry, which obviously has taken a battering over the last uh, couple of years and is continuing to do so. So I have to say it hasn't been the best uh, couple of years in that regard, but uh, we're still pushing forward and I'm still very confident that what I'm trying to achieve um, will catch on and I, I get a lot of positive feedback. Uh, but yes, kind of a one man crusade at the moment. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to introduce you guys to, to what it is that I'm trying to do. So if everybody's happy, I will attempt to share the screen. Um, right, well, as you see, yes, uh, Ben Coley, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's very difficult to know what to call myself, to be honest, because I, I'd love to call myself an astronomer, but I, I admit that I've had no formal training. I'm just a, a very keen amateur who's spotted a niche in the market, if you want to put it like that, and, and I'm trying to do something with it. Um, my background that sort of brought me to this stage uh, is the guiding industry. So as was recently uh, just mentioned, I was born and raised in England, um, but I always harbored a particular fascination with African wildlife in particular, and it was sort of the, you know, the archetypal dream of wanting to be a safari ranger and chasing lions and elephants and things around the bushveld. Never thought it would happen. And about 15 years ago, I had the opportunity uh, to do that. I should add as well that whilst in England, I did own a little telescope and I knew my way around the sky quite well, but purely for a, a hobby sort of basis. Um, and then in, two th in fact, almost 15 years ago to the day, it was the 4th of January, 2007, that I landed in South Africa. And, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and I'd signed up to do a one year field guide training course with a company called Bushwise Field Guides, which involved me doing six months of practical uh, training followed by a six month work placement. Um, and I fell in love with the industry and as I had hoped to and never left it. And I'm now very proud to say that I am uh, considered a professional safari guide. I'm also a trainer. I have actually for two years uh, up until sort of 2016 to 2018, I was head trainer at Bushwise Field Guides, the company that trained me. Um, and I'm also an assessor for the industry. So I, I still train and assess future field guides. Um, and sort of, I will move on to this part, but sort of down the line, that's how I ended up now doing what I'm doing. Because whilst astronomy and stargazing is considered a part of the syllabus of a field guide, because we are somewhat jack of all trades, it's not just finding the big scaries with big teeth and claws. We cover everything from geology to grasses, to insects, to fish, to amphibians, reptiles, and astronomy plays a role in that as well. 
unfortunately, it's a very small role. Uh, and that was something that I wanted to, to see fit to attempt to change. Um, uh, last thing I want to say before I move on is, um, yes, just in terms of photographs, I would say 95% of the pictures that you'll see in the next 20 or 25 slides or so are all mine. Um, ones that aren't, I will either tell you if I, if, uh, or they have been attributed to the, to the person that I did just sneakily find on the internet, but I have uh, referenced them where possible, otherwise they come from Wikipedia. Um, but unless you hear otherwise, they, these are all mine. Um, so let me let me move on. So just to give you a little bit of uh, information about where I am coming from at the moment. Um, can you see my cursor when I move it around on the screen? Uh, can you no, see I, can't. I can't. No. Oh. Okay. Then there's the three pictures that you see there on the left. Obviously, there's a, a full scale view of the African continent. Then in the center is a screenshot from Google Earth and that little blue blob is actually where I'm sitting and you'll see that says just under a city or well, a city uh, for, you, for you guys out in the UK you would consider it a town but it's actually the city of the province that I stay in which is called Mpumalanga uh, which is, means place of the rising sun in the local language here and Mbombela and Nelspreit which you see there on the first line are the same thing it's just sort of the English name and the, uh, the, the tribal name for the same place. Um, and you can just see just to the right of it, that sort of swathe of, of land where nothing seems to be happening. That is the, what I, I believe to be the world famous Kruger National Park, uh, which people, a lot of tourists uh, go to. And it is within the Kruger National Park and along the boundaries of the Kruger National Park. So between Nelspreit and Hoodspreit, which is sort of the next safari hub, if you like, uh, which is about 150 kilometers, 200 kilometers, so about 120 miles north of me. Uh, that's where I focus most of my work. Uh, however, since there are very few people doing what I'm doing, uh, I do travel quite far afield to other provinces in the country. And I've even been uh, up to uh, across to Namibia twice last year uh, to go and do astronomy training and some photographic work and things out there as well. So I, I canvass a, a particularly large area because there, there isn't many people in this specific area doing what I'm doing. Um, so just to give you an idea of, say, where, where I am myself, to give you so about 25 degrees south, 31 degrees east ballpark is where I am. Obviously, that will change depending on where I'm going. Uh, but the point is, obviously, the night sky that I now look at is very, very different from the night sky that you guys see. So for anybody who's not quite aware how it works, what you see looking north, I cannot see at all from here. And what you see looking south is what I see when I look north, but it's all upside down. And I will say it is upside down because I originally learned it the correct way around. Uh, so it is upside down for me still. And obviously what I see looking south, you guys can't see. And that's what I'm going to try and focus on this afternoon. Just to help you understand a little bit more, you can see that that picture on the right is a signboard saying that you are crossing the Tropic of Capricorn, which runs through the Kruger National Park. Uh, so I'm just south of the, the Tropic of Capricorn, if that helps you guys. And Kruger National Park is a huge area, uh, 20,000 square kilometers of bushveld, wilderness, whatever you want to call it. And that forms part of what is called the Limpopo Transfrontier Park, uh, which involves sort of corresponding wildlife preserves in Zimbabwe and Mozambique, where fences have been dropped, uh, which ultimately, you know, the idea is to create a natural system for the animals to move around in. And that entire area now is close touch and go about 100,000 square kilometers of conserved land. So we are very, very honored to have that here. Um, which means that it drives a lot of tourist traffic or <laughs> did drive a lot of tourist traffic here up until a couple of years ago. Um, although they are slowly coming back now. But the, the benefit of having wonderful wildlife preservation areas, of course, is there's very little in terms of human habitation and light pollution and industry pollution and everything else. And we are very lucky that in terms of uh, light pollution indexes and bortle indexes, uh, the Kruger National Park ranges sort of between bortle one to bortle three stars, depending on uh, you know, how close to the border that you are. So again, if you look at that map, you can see the Kruger National Park is that sort of uh, strip just to the right um, of the image there, to, to the right of the yellow parts. Uh, so in the southern areas, it's a little bit brighter. That's Bortle 3. But the further north you go and the further east you go, it's Bortle 2, Bortle 1. Um, and we're privy to some absolutely spectacular skies out here. Even though it does get a little bit humid, say summer for us, which is obviously it is our summer now. 
um, is very difficult for us because it is a tropical subtropical climate. So we do have quite a lot of cloud cover uh, over summer. We have afternoon thunderstorms and we have a lot of humidity, which obviously, particularly from an imaging point of view, uh, is not particularly helpful. And it has been a horrific uh, last couple of months in that regard. I have literally had one clear night where I am now in two months. It, it's been that bad, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so we're very lucky. So when I go and do these evenings, um, I, I'm privy to some, some wonderfully dark skies. And I have to say, because of that, it, it has taken quite a lot of learning, because I'm sure you guys know the darker the skies, the more you can see, and the more you have to remember in terms of tracing out the constellations and identifying certain things. But that's a good problem to have, not, not that we're complaining at all. Okay, so just, um, oh, sorry, uh, just obviously in terms of South African astronomy as well, I feel whilst I'm focusing on this area, which is sort of the northeast of the country, uh, a, a few of you may be very well aware of an area which is sort of south or north of Cape Town, we would call it the sort of southern interior of the country, which is called the Karoo, uh, which is considered one of the best places in the world to stargaze. Um, and there are government grade research telescopes there. You may have heard of the SALT telescope, the South African large telescope, which is the largest Southern uh, hemisphere single mirror telescope in the world, I believe at about 10 meters across. And we also have the radio telescopes of the Meerkat and the SKA array as well, which is sort of already online and is growing um, uh, in conjunction with uh, other arrays in different countries as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get down there. In fact, I've never been down there because I'm fairly focused in this area. I was supposed to go down there last year, but obviously that unfortunately didn't happen. So it's still very much uh, on the list of things to do. Uh, but just to give you a sort of little bit of uh, information about what I do when I'm not doing the stargazing stuff, because this is all how I've ended up to what I'm doing now. So over the last 15 years or 13 years, we should say as a full-time safari guide, this is the sort of thing I get up to. So I drive people around in open safari vehicles and we do guided walks, uh, obviously with a, with a rifle for safety in big five areas. So lions, leopards, elephants, rhinos, buffaloes, wild dogs, cheetahs, giraffes, zebras, these are the sorts of things we encounter, even though we try and avoid them whilst we're on foot to some extent, but obviously in a vehicle, it's a little bit different. Um, and you can see I've been fortunate enough to be involved in some conservation projects uh, that elephant on the bottom right is not deceased. It was tranquilized because we were collaring it for uh, research purposes. You can see the rhino at the top, unfortunately, was having to be dehorned because of all the poaching problems that we have here. Um, and we do walking trails. The one with me there sort of uh, slouched across the rock. We were doing about a five day trail, sleeping rough, uh, and just exploring with some students there. And you take the opportunity to have a cat nap, whatever you can. Uh, and that does lead obviously to doing sleep outs and things with guests and students under the stars, which is a perfect time to do some stargazing and introduce people to the southern skies. Um, so just to give you an idea of some of the uh, sort of, well, I'd say pitfalls, the, the amazing things that we're privy to here. These are all just a, well, a few snaps that I've taken through the years of the kind of things that we encounter here. So, um, and I bring these up because Whilst they're fantastic to look at, when you are sleeping rough in the bush, they, they do become uh, something you have to pay a little bit more attention to. Um, and when I do sometimes do stargazing evenings in the bush without any fences around us or anything, because that's all part of the sort of the USP and the draw card, we do have to be very much aware of these things. Um, and there have been uh, times where I've had to cancel evenings because we have been interrupted by some of the indigenous wildlife, but uh, so that's all sort of part of the service and part of the enjoyment of, of what we do or what I do. And so very much obviously the crux of what I've tried to push. So just to try and explain to you, so I, I did about eight years of what would be considered straight guiding, i.e. working in a lodge, guests come in, you take them out for drives, uh, you stop off and you do a little bit of stargazing and things with them in the evening on the way home. Um, and then from there, I moved on into training future field guides, which I did for another sort of four or five years as well. Um, and what I realized during that time is that, as I said at the beginning, whilst stargazing and astronomy is part of the guiding syllabus out here, if you want to be a professional field guide, I mean, it literally is about six or seven pages in the manual. And it is the absolute sort of basics that, to be honest, most people would do at um, you know, secondary school. Um, you know, to some of the locals, of course, this is this is quite hard work, but for some of us, it's not particularly challenging. Um, and it's very much apparent that the majority of the lodge industry hasn't really embraced this, considering the opportunities that we have. As I said, we've got beautiful dark skies. 
Um, and guiding for me is all about the whole safari experience is all about connecting to nature, spending time in nature, uh, finding something you didn't know you were missing, uh, you know, and being a part of something much bigger. And one of the sort of the taglines that I use for my company, Celestial Events, uh, is the ultimate connection with nature, because I believe that there is something in all of us that causes us to stare up at the sky um, and just lose ourselves after we've had a bad day. And there's something therapeutic about it and it puts the world into perspective. Um, so we're very fortunate uh, that I had the opportunity to do that. And, and just coupled with that is, I don't know if any of you guys have been fortunate enough to come out on a safari, be it in South Africa or East Africa or Botswana or Zimbabwe, anywhere like that. But I think it's even more special when you get to view the stars, when you're surrounded by nature as well. There is an ambiance that you cannot, you no know, disrespect to anybody who's, who's doing things in observatories, you know, in, in a field somewhere, but there's something special about that possibility that something might sort of creep up on you and you have to be aware and it sort of adds to the experience um, and as I said I've had a few run-ins thankfully we've not had anything too serious uh, just to give you a few sort of little anecdotes I mean I've cancelled or we've had to all jump in the vehicle because I was doing a stargazing evening with the telescope on an airstrip close to a lodge once and we shine periodically shine or I have somebody there to just shine the spotlight around to make sure and we saw some eyes glinting back at us at the other end of the airstrip, slowly walking towards us. And what was actually walking towards us was about 12 lions heading straight our way. So we all had to jump back in the vehicle and they sort of walked past and they sniffed the telescope and thankfully left it alone and carried on. And then we carried on afterwards. Um, I've been doing evenings and we've had a leopard calling, territorial calling very close by. And it, it's deafening when it's so dark and so quiet. And that really adds to the experience. Um, I've had a run in with a black rhino out on my own whilst taking photography and I've had to shimmy up a dead tree just in case. Um, but I see that as all part of the fun of being out here. OK, so moving on to um, celestial events. So how did I get onto that? As I said, I felt the industry was sadly lacking um, and and there just wasn't. The interest being shown from the guides uh, to, to do a stargazing thing as part of their evening. Uh, and I, I realized that that was because they just weren't given the opportunity and they, they didn't have the knowledge and therefore they didn't have the confidence to try and go ahead with it. And that's what I wanted to change. Uh, so I started Celestial Events, uh, which I was still running on a part time basis whilst I was still guiding and sort of working it as and when I could. Um, and so the first thing I started out with is what I, I coined Night Sky Safaris to try and stick with the whole African theme. And this is probably what I spend most of my time doing. And it's particularly uh, within the lodge industry. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith come and stay at some of the, the very nice lodges that we have out here uh, and they want something a little bit different to do. Uh, and so they, they ask me to come in and I, I give stargazing evenings to the guests. I normally out there for somewhere between 90 minutes and two hours. And I like to focus as much as possible on the cultural side of it because I don't think people come to the bush to be drowned in science and big numbers and things because I think there's only so much the brain can take. So very much the, the mythology we, we play a, plays a big role, the, the cultural African stories, but I also dip into as much as I can find. I don't keep it specifically to Africa, so I cover Egyptian culture, North American culture, Aborigine culture, uh, Greek, Roman, whatever I can find, really, what I think is, is interesting and, and can tell a good story, because a guide is a storyteller. Um, and I started out with, you can see there on the bottom left, my 10-inch uh, uh, Mead LX200, telescope obviously gps aligned with the go-to system and everything a little bit of a learning curve for me but i did it as a hobby before i started offering this uh, but i do a lot of work with the laser pointer on binoculars purely because most people don't have access to these sorts of things when they go home and I, and I want people to feel a connection with the night sky without feeling that they have to have a big telescope to look through to do that there's something very satisfying about just staring up at the stars so we trace the constellations, discuss the mythology. Obviously, we look at the moon in detail, depending on the phase and the time of year and the time of the month, the time of the evening, uh, any planets that are visible and all sorts of the DSOs, the deep sky objects that we can do. And I also do some virtual stargazing. Uh, currently, I haven't done it for a while because of the weather conditions, but I've done three or four virtual evenings for a company in America called Wyoming Stargazing, where we stream live images to them during the daytime, it gives them an opportunity to view Southern Hemisphere objects that they wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And they can do it during the daytime and we have kids involved as well because it's a, a far more um, 
the word I wanted. It's, it's a better time for them. It's not past their bedtime. Put it that way. Uh, I have since, as you see on the bottom right there, I've since uh, had my LX200 deforked because I've started getting into astrophotography a little bit more. And I got myself a, a second-hand CGEM Celestron CGEM DX mount, uh, which can easily handle the payload of my LX200 OTA. And again, I've sort of had to, to learn how to use that. Uh, that is now my kit that, that I go with to most places. But I have found that it's actually got a bit too much zoom. Prime focus is two and a half thousand millimeters, which for something like the Orion Nebula, you only, you only get a small portion of it. And even some of the larger globular clusters, you're sort of missing any perspective. I can't, I can't look at the Pleiades through it because they just look like normal stars. Uh, so that's why I'm in the process. Hopefully in the next month or two, I'm going to have the, uh, the Williams Optics GT71, which I think is a 600 mil focal length. And I'm getting the focal reducer as well for the photography aspect uh, also. Okay, so the other thing, one of the other things I do is I do offer long exposure and astrophotography, sort of basic tuition as well. So I also have a Skywatch uh, uh, Star Tracker, the, the SAM, the mini version of it, although I'm again hoping to, to move up uh, when the business starts paying dividends and I can afford one. I'd like to upgrade that and get another one because at the moment everybody uses my one, so I have to cap the, uh, the evenings that I do in terms of numbers. Um, and I normally do those with a presentation of normally about an hour just with the techniques in terms of long exposure, the Star Trackers, uh, image stacking, dark frames, those sorts of things. Um, and then obviously we dabble a little bit uh, with the, the deep space photography, as long as it's at the moment, it's fairly restricted to Canons and Nikons just because of uh, the adapters that I've got. But thankfully that are, those are the most common, whether they're mirrorless, I've got adapters for mirrorless or the DSLRs. Uh, and all the photos that you see on here are all taken, obviously you've got M42 there, uh, taken with a Nikon D7000, which is not exactly an astro modded camera. It's a crop sensor. Um, but thankfully, those were taken, or well, that picture, particularly on the top right there, was taken out in Namibia under Bortle One Sky, Bortle One Stars, close to Sosa's Flay, if anybody knows the big sort of dunes in the Namib Rand uh, Reserve, which is also considered an international dark sky reserve by the International Astronomical Union. And because of the dry nature there, it is one of the best places. Sort of you know, you're talking, you put that in the same category as the Atacama Desert, where you can go and do these sorts of things. That's a mosaic of two photos because of the crop sensor. Um, obviously, the, the picture of Saturn there, I also have a ZWO 290 uh, color camera. Uh, so that one there was captured through the LX200 uh, using what they call the lucky imaging. So taking about a, a one minute video of about 6,000 frames, uh, processing it through uh, Registax and auto stackers and things, getting the best frames, uh, stacking them and then editing them with the, the wavelets and then also through into Photoshop. I'm very proud of that one of Saturn. Yes, the stars were superimposed in the background just to give it a little bit of depth, uh, but that's by far and away the best planetary image that I have achieved so far. And yeah, the other ones are all taken with a, a, a stock unmodified, I might add 10 year old, very dusty Nikon D7000 that's been bouncing around Land Rovers for the last 10 years. Um, so I have great plans to improve this in the future. Uh, but I take people and I give, yeah, we do, uh, so we do the presentation. We spend about two hours taking photographs of things, just normal long exposures. People get a chance to use the tracker and the telescope. And then I do a post-processing session on Photoshop with them as well, uh, either in person if it's at a lodge and they're staying overnight or if I'm doing a standalone event, I'll do it over Zoom like this at a, at a date that works for everybody else. Now, what I'm perhaps most proud of, and obviously what I'm trying to push here uh, in South Africa particularly, is trying to get guides interested in this, because in my experience, because I used to do stargazing with my guests on safari an awful lot, because it was a particular interest of mine, uh, is to get the industry up to standard to be able to deliver say what I've coined a, a night sky safari for their guests because they're always so complimentary of it even if it's just a little 15 minute stop and pointing out what to to me or Ben probably you guys are the obvious sites the moon Orion Scorpius Taurus Gemini Pleiades those sorts of things so many people don't know it and they don't know the stories behind them and they're blown away by it and what I also love about it is it's not, I can tell you all the vital statistics of an elephant or a lion, but when you guys go back to England, that's fairly irrelevant. But if I can give you the, the basics of how to navigate the night sky and, and, and try and generate some interest, 
that is something that you can then take home wherever you are on the, in the world. And as long as it's not cloudy, you can then develop that interest and pass it on. And it's wonderful if you've got family as well and the kids get involved. And I think it's a really great way to bring people together. So the guiding industry out here is regulated by FAGASA, as we call it, which is the Field Guide Association of Southern Africa. And so as it says there, that's the quote off their website. Uh, Fugaz's philosophy is one of representing and promoting a high standard of guiding and skills development within the tourism industry for its members. That's supposed to include astronomy, but to be honest, it's very disappointing what's in there. So I contacted as a Fugaza member for many years and as a bit of a nerd and uh, so an amateur astronomer, I contacted them and said, look, we could do so much more here. Why don't we create a specialist astronomy qualification that guides can do and learn about? And they said, if you want to do it, go nuts. And I think they said they thought that I never would because a lot of people come up with those, those ideas, but they hadn't met me. Um, and yeah, March 2020, the, we sort of put out a, a first edition about 18 months ago now uh, just to test the water, which got quite good feedback. And then I redid it and did it properly and we had it printed nicely. And that was launched March. So it says March 2020. That's actually a mistake. Sorry, that should be March 2019. Uh, because timings wise, that's about as bad as we could have done because of the current situation we all find ourselves in. Um, however, that didn't stop me from trying. And I'm very proud to say that it is in circulation. And we've got quite a few people who have got copies of the manuals now. And I I have done everything uh, for that from the manual itself, the workbook that accompanies it. There's an exam that there has to be that they have to sit. There's a practical assessment in order to be well, deemed a, an advanced astronomy guide or a night sky guide. I think we're still arguing about what we want to call it. Um, and here, is, here it is in front of me. So it's, it's quite a, a chunky thing, but there's a lot of uh, pretty photos in there as well, uh, just because I think you know, it's a lot to ask people uh, to digest all of that. You need photos for something like this for people to be able to fully understand it. Um, and one of the other things out here is, yes, we, we live in the 21st century, but a lot of the guides that we're talking about here either don't have access to fancy phones and laptops, which can download all this information at the touch of a button, or they're working in wilderness areas where there's no Wi-Fi connection, very sporadic signal. And we, and my, this includes myself, are used to just go, oh, I don't know, I'll Google it. But many people out here don't have that ability. Uh, and I don't like the fact that we can do that. And I personally, I grew up with books. I like books and I wanted to make it, as I said, they're a one-stop shop, which includes everything. The idea behind this manual was that you won't need to Google anything because this has been put together through my experiences with guests. And I've tried to answer all the questions that get thrown at me by guests and all the things that I think would be relevant, <clears throat> particularly to a, a field guide in terms of, so this is not an exhaustive list on the left here. These are the sort of the majority of things that are covered. So how to plan a night time and the moon phase and the safety and how you're going to deliver the information to be careful when it comes to religion versus astronomy without alienating guests. All of those things have to be factored in. What are you going to bring with you? Um, if you've got older generation, you know, do you want them all standing there with their necks uh, points staring up at the sky for an hour? That's not going to work. So just trying to get people thinking about the ergonomics of it all, if you will. Um, I cover a lot of the, or some of the history as well, right the way back to sort of uh, the cultural side and things like uh, the potential references of constellations in ancient architecture and the whole archaeoastronomy idea. Obviously, we go through uh, Aristotle and Copernicus and Brahe and Kepler all the way up to, and I was not in depth, I might add. It's, you know, a, a little paragraph or two, or two on each one with some pictures to try and help explain what's going on, uh, all the way up to Hubble and, and where we are today. A little bit on astronomy in South Africa, because obviously that's very relevant. Galaxies, star formation, celestial nomads. Uh, what I mean by that is that's asteroids and comets and shooting stars and meteorites and, and those sorts of things. Sun and the moon, the planets, and then obviously a particular focus on the constellations. Obviously, I haven't covered all of the constellations because there are just too many. So I've chosen about 30 to 35 of the prominent constellations down here, many of which you guys will be familiar with. Uh, including obviously all the zodiacal signs because those are things that people are aware of and might have heard some of those Greek myth mythological stories over the years. 
And, and we cover particularly binocular objects because most guides don't have access to telescopes. So there's not much point giving them too much information on something you could only see when you take long exposure photography of a deep sky object as pretty as it is. Uh, it's fairly irrelevant to a field guide. So yeah, so I'm very, very proud of this one. I'll just sort of give you a sort of a flick through so you can see it's, there's lots of pictures in there and various information on the moon and there's some planets there, Olympus Mons I just saw flick past. Uh, sunspots I saw there, uh, epicycles, nucleosynthesis, star clusters, uh, light rainbows, why sunsets are red, uh, or everything I could think of that would be relevant to the guiding industry is in there. Um, and sort of how that works, so, so well, what I offer I should say in terms of that is I do on-site theoretical and practical training, so I will go to the lodge or they will come to me, and if I'm doing the full syllabus I try and do it over four days, uh, so we'll do at least one lecture a day, usually to fit around lodge logistics, and then we'll do one practical evening as well, uh, where we will do a, a naked eye evening, a binocular evening, a telescopic evening, and a photographic evening, um, and really try and, and repetition as well, because you can't expect people to remember everything after just one evening. Um, yeah, then there's a workbook based on the manual that they have to fill in, uh, an exam, and Fogaza, this is not me, this is a Fogaza directive, the pass mark over here for Fogaza is 75%. Uh, which I approve of because we don't want average, we want good. That's the whole point of what Fogaza is trying to do to uplift the industry. Um, then there is a practical assessment. Uh, so I would go as the assessor and we would gather some guests or hopefully with actual guests there and the guide would deliver a sort of a 45 minutes to an hour interesting presentation with a laser pointer and binoculars. The telescope is not required and they just have to regale us with some interesting stories about the night sky and keep us entertained and give us factually correct uh, information in an enthusiastic and understandable manner, basically. Uh, and then I recommend to the lodges, although of course, a lot of it's weather dependent, uh, that we do a refresher training, just a practical training session every three months. Because remember in the safari industry, our evening safaris tend to go out at around about the same time and then you come back at around about the same time and it's quite a, you've got maybe an hour of darkness an hour and a half of darkness perhaps um, and as you guys well know the sky three months later if you're looking at that specific time looks very different um, and it doesn't matter how well you know the sky in January if you look at it it's 8 30 in the evening in the same direction in March April it'll look very different um, and so that's why I recommend three or every three to four months come and do a, a recap of what's visible at that time. Okay, and then in terms of industry reach thus far, I mean, I have done training in, in five of the nine provinces in South Africa. I don't know whether any of these names will make sense to you guys. Maybe some of you have traveled this side or not, but in terms, these are quite well-known game reserves out here, or uh, most of them bordering the Kruger National Park. The Sabi Sands is probably the most famous one out here. It's the most sort of affluent one and the busiest one in terms of tourism. Uh, the Timbavati, Klasiri, Nambiti is in KwaZulu-Natal, so that's much further south, Thornybush. Belkhofunden is north of Johannesburg, so that's about 400 kilometers west of where I sit at the moment. Uh, Manuleti I've put in there as well, purely because that is an interesting one, because that is the Shangan word, which is one of the local tribes here, means place of stars. Uh, Nileti means stars, and Manuleti is the place of stars. Uh, and then in specific lodges, just in case anyone has visited any of these, the Londolosi's Ulusaba, which is Richard Branson's private lodge, or well, private lodge, but lodge out here. Um, Singita, you may have heard of, they've got lodges all over East Africa as well as Southern Africa and beyond, also a, a sort of a continent-wide company. Then I also, there are training providers like the one that I was when I was a student uh, that I go and train at. Uh, as part of now the guide training course, I go in and in fact, I'm doing that uh, in about two weeks time. I'm going back to Bushwise where I did my training and going to do a specialist two day astronomy course as part of the guide training syllabus now. Um, I try and do work with some of the community guides as well, uh, because obviously they, they don't have access to this sort of thing uh, and community outreach stuff. And I've even, just to give you an idea of how popular it, it's becoming, I hope, is in the last six months, I've had inquiries from lodges in Botswana, even in Tanzania, which is, you know, uh, thousands of kilometers north of me. Namibia, I've been to twice already. And then the uh, yeah, independent training courses of just people who aren't guides, but just want to do more than just have a, a tour of the night sky. They want to learn. So I do 
uh, also sort of training courses for Joe Public uh, as well. So I hope to be busy, uh, but it's, it's sporadic and somewhat weather dependent. Okay, so that's sort of a precy of what I have been doing with myself over the last couple of years. Um, as I, say, I still subsidize it with all of my guiding work as well, particularly during the summer months because of the weather, but I'm trying very hard to push this and I've got big plans for this year in terms of where I hope to take uh, the company moving forward and, and making, making a difference and doing my bit for the industry. So that brings me on to sort of part two of the presentation, if you like, which is just to give you a bit more information about the sort of things that we look at here in the southern skies, the stuff that you can't see. Uh, from where you sit at the moment. I don't know how many guys you've had on here from Southern Hemisphere countries, so a lot of this may be uh, repetition for you, but repetition is how we learn, so here we go. And uh, so this is Southern Skies at about 11 o'clock this time of year, 11 o'clock midnight, um, looking pretty much due south. So you might see a lot of sort of ob unusual constellations on there that you may not be too familiar with. You could just see Orion sticking out at the top because obviously we have Orion in Canis Major, we can see despite the fact that they're standing on their head up here. Um, but we've got what used to be the Argo Navis, which is now split into Vela, Puppis and Carina. And there are some stunning deep sky objects in that area of the Milky Way. Crooks, you might be able to see there towards the bottom left next to Centaurus. Beautiful constellations, lots of interesting stuff to look at there. Obviously, Crooks being the Southern Cross, which is probably the most, well, the smallest of the 88 constellations in terms of area of sky with the IAU boundaries, and certainly the most famous constellation that we have down here. And then a lot of sort of little ones, which were named much later on, not by the Greeks, by the, the Dutch travelers who came down here, and uh, also by uh, some French astronomers who were uh, in Cape Town area, the, a guy called De La Caille named quite a lot of them down here, all named after uh, scientific instruments. And you'll see the ones they named after animals were from the Dutch. So Volans is a flying fish, Muska the fly, chameleon speaks for itself, Hydrus the water snake, the phoenix, Tucana the toucan. And then you've got things like Fornax the furnace, the furnace, uh, Mensa, which is a good one. Uh, you see right in the center there, just underneath what is the large Magellanic cloud, which we'll come on to. Uh, which is actually in honor of Table Mountain, which is obviously just there by Cape Town. Uh, Octans, which is a, yeah, one of the, another scientific instrument. Apus, bird of paradise. Uh, there are the pictures. Oh, it's absolutely pouring with rain outside now in keeping with our summer weather. <laughs> um, I hope we don't lose Wi-Fi connection. Uh, to be a bit more of an idea. But in terms of, sort of what we are looking at, I think it would be rude not to start with the Southern Cross. Uh, oh, I've just got a, my internet connection is unstable, so I hope I don't lose you guys. Uh, so this is the Southern Cross and then what we call the, the pointers, which are not actually part of the Southern Cross. They are part of Centaurus, that's Alpha and Beta Centauri, or Rigel Centaurus and Hadar are their proper names. Uh, and the Southern Cross, as I said, is uh, <clears throat> very important out here, especially for guiding, especially in terms of navigation. You guys, and as an astrophotographer, I am highly envious that you can just line your star trackers and your equatorial mounts at Polaris. I have to get binoculars out and try and find a specific pattern of stars in the sky that you can't see with the naked eye. Set up another tripod with a laser pointer pointing at it so I can find it in the finder scope of my equatorial mounts and things and only then align it by putting stars in little circles in the, the reticule. It gets very complicated and it, it takes even if I have a good night, it's still going to take me half an hour to try and get it quite dialed in. Uh, it's one of the pitfalls of being down here. But to find the Celestial South, we use the Southern Cross uh, to do so because we don't have a star. So what we do is we draw a line through the longitudinal axis of the Southern Cross. Uh, and then we take a line from the center point of what we call the pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri at 90 degrees perpendicular. And we draw those two lines where those two lines intersect is basically celestial south and then you use your binoculars to find sigma octans and the, the little uh, asterisms that we look for that aren't visible for the naked eye and straight down to the horizon from there will give you due south and I can assure you as a field guide who drives around in a Land Rover after dark through roads where there are no signposts and no street lamps and the roads change all the time because elephants push trees over them and things uh, I've used the stars to help me get home on more than one occasion and I'm very grateful for them. Um, so the Southern Cross, though, is, is a wonderful constellation out here. Not only does it help us find south, it's very important culturally as well. 
uh, not just in South Africa, but across the Southern Hemisphere nations. Again, you guys may well be aware of this, but the flags of Australia and New Zealand both show the Southern Cross on them because for them it's a circumpolar constellation. Uh, it never sets behind or under the horizon. Uh, for us, it does disappear under the horizon for about two or three hours and then pops up the other side. Uh, so there are times when it becomes a little bit more difficult, but of course we've got other ways. We can actually use Orion to help us find north by using uh, the belt and his sword to sort of make an arrow which points north for us. Um, and then in terms of sort of cultural mythology for uh, Africa uh, particularly, obviously we go back as far as the Bushmen here, some of the earliest people 20,000 years ago, if not longer. We're not really sure, um, but for them, you know, there are beautiful cultural stories that they use. So the Bushmen used to see the four points or the four stars of the Southern Cross as four lionesses and the fifth faintest star there, which isn't labeled, but Epsilon Crucis would be their young cub. And as the Southern Cross rotates across the sky, it's followed by Alpha and Beta Centauri, the two pointers, and they were seen as the two male lions following the pride as they moved across the savannah. Uh, which is exactly the way it works here. If you guys have been on safari, the males are very lazy and they go where the females go because they're generally only after one thing or two things, food or let's just call it recreational opportunities. So as the females move, the males then stand up and begrudgingly follow behind because they don't want to miss out on something. Um, and in the Zulu culture, a little bit more recently than that, they saw... Uh, I, again, the pointers as some male giraffes and the, the cross as a group of female giraffes. Uh, I actually think it works better if you think, bearing in mind from this picture, it's going to be upside down. Uh, but if you take the pointers as the neck and then the, the cross of the Southern Cross as the head of a giraffe, it has the sort of um, diag uh, diamond shape that a giraffe's head has. And that fifth smaller star would be the eye of the giraffe. So in this picture, it's upside down. Um, and they see it as a, a celestial giraffe. And even the traditional local name for this constellation in quite a few tribal cultures means giraffe uh, because of those stories as well. So lots of And then contained within the Southern Cross, this uh, picture was not, is not one of mine. This was uh, pinched from Wikipedia, I think. Um, you can see we've got some lovely deep sky objects to look for here. So we've got the jewel box open cluster where that little arrow is pointing to, which you can just pick out as the naked eye. Looks like a faint star. Uh, but through binoculars, you can see about five or six stars. Uh, but through a, a telescope like my 10 inch Mead with two and a half thousand millimeter focal length and then a nice eyepiece on top, you can start resolving tens of stars. And that is an open cluster of baby stars around about a hundred or so of them there. Uh, and you've also got that dark patch just underneath the arrow, which is known as the coal sack, uh, which is a beautiful absorption nebula that we have over here as well. So a dark nebula obstructing our view of the Milky Way behind it. Uh, two, two of them are not associated at all, but lovely objects to look at. So there's a photograph um, of the jewel box that I took through the, the mead. And you can see in the center there, that line of three stars. I haven't quite picked up the colors. You can obviously see the, the red giant, super red super giant there, but through a telescope, you can clearly see that those three stars are different colors. You've got a red, reddish one, a yellowish one, and a greenish one. And we lovingly call those the traffic lights uh, because they do look like a set of traffic lights. And one of the beautiful things about the jewel box, as the name suggests, is there's lots of lovely colored stars in there. And it was actually John Herschel who described it as a casket of variously colored precious stones. And that's where we get the name from. Um, so I haven't put on there, but it's NGC 4755, if any of you guys ever have a chance to go and have a look at it. And it's one of the youngest open clusters that we know of. Uh, it's only estimate or low end estimates consider some of those stars to be as young as 7 million years old, which is, I'm sure you guys appreciate, is very young astronomically speaking. Um, six and a half thousand light years away, and it was actually discovered by uh, the French astronomer Nicolas de Lacaille from his observatory in Cape Town in the 1700s. Uh, and if you don't know much about that guy, he's an incredible guy. He spent about somewhere between 18 months and two years in that observatory, and in that time he uh, plotted the position of over 10,000 stars in that time from his observatory, and there is a plaque up in the area sort of honoring the work that he did. And then the coal sack, that dark nebula, again, you can see that's only about 600 light years away. You can see it on the right hand image there, right in the center of the Milky Way, that dark splodge. Um, and a, 
I'll give you a better view of it. This is a this is a composite photograph that I took. That's Dead Flay, the very famous salt pan in Namibia in the foreground. And the background is a, a long exposure Milky Way shot with that star tracker that I took from South Africa, and I composited the two images because I just thought it, they fitted very well together. Uh, and you can see on the far left, in the far top left corner, you can see the Southern Cross and the two pointers, and just under the Southern Cross, hopefully you can see that sort of dark circle, which is the, the coal sack. Now, what's interesting in Aboriginal um, mythology is that they didn't just look at the stars, they also looked at these beautiful dust lanes running through the Milky Way. And to them, you can see, if you, if you look at it there, you can see there's almost like a, a pointy bit at the bottom of that dark patch. Uh, and they saw that as the head of a giant celestial emu, uh, which I managed to find this uh, picture online as well, where you can actually see how they sort of traced it out. And so there are stories that maybe in Africa they saw a giant ostrich here, but it's hard to know what's been bastardized, you know, over thousands of years. Uh, but it's always a nice one to point out to people. And once somebody visualizes it, you can never unvisualize it. It does look like a giant bird spanning half the sky. So that's a nice one to do to just have a break from looking at stars to rather look at the, the dark patches and the dust lanes in the Milky Way because we're privy to such beautiful dark skies. In the Kruger area, you can see the Milky Way in spectacular glory just with the naked eye. Okay, and then of course we have the what we call the Cape Clouds down here or the, the map. Okay, we're going to wait uh, to see if uh, Ben comes back for the time being. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoying the uh, the views. Splendid so far. Okay. I think I'm back. Am I back? You're back, Ben. Okay, I'm sorry, we're having a, there's, the rain's quite bad. And as I said, Wi-Fi out here uh, can be questionable at times. Uh, let me try and go back to where we were. Okay, can you guys see again? Uh, yes, we've got the large uh, Magellanic cloud. Yes, large budget. Uh, where did you lose me? Uh, you were you just on the emu, and uh, you were just about to talk about your next. There, the Cape Cloud. Okay, that one. Okay, great. Give me two seconds here. Right there, we go. Okay, so the Magellanic Clouds, uh, so yes, yeah, so this is the, the large Magellanic Cloud, the bigger one of the, of the two. The one on the left is an image that I took from Namibia again, so lovely dark skies, but you can see it was above the lodge at the time. And even though there are strict regulations, because it's a IOU uh, International Dark Sky uh, Reserve, even the light from the lodges, even though they are muted, so you can see a bit of light pollution at the bottom. The one on the right was so pinched from Wikipedia. Uh, but they're clear as day. You can see them out here under dark skies. They look like permanent clouds in the sky. And they are, of course, actually dwarf galaxies that we can see with our naked eye quite clearly. Um, 170,000 light years away, the Large Magellanic Cloud, about 14,000 light years across, 30 billion stars. I don't want to just bore you with, with, with facts like that. You guys can read those up there. But it's wonderful to see. And even through binoculars, you can sort of make out the elongated structure of the Magellanic Cloud because it has been distorted through the gravitational interactions of getting a bit too close to the Milky Way. And also with its partner, the small Magellanic Cloud, they're also all gravitationally acting on one another. And this probably did used to be a nice barred spiral galaxy, a bit like we think the Milky Way looks like, but it has been distorted now and is continuing to do so. Still a lot of conjecture whether they are orbiting the Milky Way or just passing by or, or what's going, you know, are we going to see them again? Have we seen them before? I don't know. I'm not a professional astrophysicist, but they're very pretty to look at. And it's, a, it's an awesome thing to talk about. Um, and you may just be able to see, well, let me do the small Magellanic cloud quickly. I'm going to speed it up just in case we lose connectivity again. So the small Magellanic cloud, a lot smaller, about half the size. Um, but you can see, it, it's very clear to see that bright star on the right is not associated, associated with it. That's one of the brightest stars in the constellation of Hydrus, uh, the water snake, uh, not to be confused with Hydra, which you have in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, as well. So we have a Hydra and a Hydrus. This is a smaller constellation that sort of wraps around the small Magellanic Cloud. Um, but within these objects are some wonderful things to look at. So if you have a look at the these two images of the Large Magellanic Cloud on the left-hand image, if you see at the bottom left, there's sort of a white spot just to the left of the bar. And on the right-hand image, you can see it at uh, 
to the left and just above the, the bar is a sort of a pink spot. That is the Tarantula Nebula, uh, which is considered to be one of the largest area of star formation anywhere within the local group of galaxies that we are a part of. And you can see it with the naked eye, even on, even where I am here at Nels, just outside Nelspreit, which is about Bortle 5 uh, sky. If you know where you're looking, you can pick it up with averted vision, no problem, which is pretty impressive considering it is a star forming region in another galaxy. Um, it's a magnitude eight, they reckon. About a thousand light years across, uh, but I think the most staggering fact about it, it is so large, I'm sure you guys know M42, the Orion Nebula, very, very well. If we were to substitute the Tarantula Nebula to the same distance as M42, the Orion Nebula, at sort of 1,500 light years away, it would take up an area of about 80 full moons um, and stretch from the horizon to about 50 degrees up into the sky. So nearly half of the sky would be taken up by that object if it was where the Orion Nebula was, and it would be bright enough to cast shadows on a moonless night. That is how big and bright that area is and why we can see it with the naked eye. Um, just one of the little star clusters inside there has been recorded of having a, uh, over 800,000 stars in just one of many little clusters of stars within that area. Uh, again, this, this image I found online, which I think is a spectacular image. I have no idea who this guy is, uh, but he obviously knows what he's doing. This is my attempt with a standard DSLR camera. Uh, 30 second exposure. I think, no, these were 50 second exposures, about... 30 or 50 of them, I think, stacked and, and edited. Um, but I'm in, hopefully going to be getting myself a, a nice, proper astronomical ZWO camera again later in the year. So I hope to improve on that, but I'm very happy with what I've got so far. Uh, and then just off the small Magellanic cloud, again, right in the center image there, you can see the small Magellanic cloud and above it, you can see the second largest and brightest globular cluster in the sky, which is called 47 Chicana. NGC 104, not a very amazing name, but again, people didn't know what it was back in the day, and it's in the constellation of Tucana the Toucan, and so it was just given a designation like a star would be. A uh, picture on the left I took out in Namibia, again, through the Mead telescope, uh, and the picture on the right comes from Wikipedia. And uh, we are talking about uh, something that's about 13,000 light years away, 120 light years across, containing over half a million stars very, very old stars being globular clusters that have been out there for a very, very long time. There's uh, very little dust and gas there. And if there is any new star formation there, it's, it's what we call blue stragglers. So you might you can see from that picture that I've taken, there's a lot of reddish colored stars there because they are very, very old. Uh, but if you zoom right in there, you can see some blue stars, which you wouldn't expect to see in a globular cluster. But because they're so densely packed, occasionally they bump into one another and potentially that sparks a new star to be formed. And all of a sudden you have this rather unusual blue star that you wouldn't expect to see. Uh, but a beautiful object through a telescope, I always describe it's like a, it's like glitter, like a sort of a, a spider web glistening in the, in the sunshine and the early morning light. Uh, really, really lovely objects to, to view for guests. They, they really get a, a, an impression of just to try and, to try and, Explain to someone they're looking at half a million stars in one eyepiece is not easy, but when they can clearly see just how many stars are in there, you, they, you can actually start to get them on board with these crazy notions. Uh, that's part of the fun. Okay, speaking of globular clusters, I know you guys have M13, the Hercules cluster, uh, which is your brightest one. I think you can see from your latitude, certainly, which is the only the fourth or the fifth brightest in the sky. We are we get all the other ones down here. So this is the second brightest, and then the, the showstopper is Omega Centauri in the constellation of Centaurus, as the name would suggest. It's the red circle there, the Centaurus A galaxy above it, uh, which I'm not going to, to mention this evening, but you can even pick that out with a pair of binoculars if you know where you're looking as well. It's uh, the fifth brightest galaxy in the sky. Uh, but Omega Centauri is, is an is a absolutely spectacular object. You can see it there, my attempt on the left, but that was taken about two years ago. I, I like to think I've improved, so hopefully I'll get a better one. And the one on the right really shows you uh, a little bit more detail in terms of just how big it is. So if 47 Tucan is the second biggest at half a million stars, there you're looking at about 10 million stars all in one place. And again, I don't know how much about Omega Centauri you guys know, um, but it is so much bigger than all the others that it got people thinking 
And it also has retrograde motion in terms of the, the way the rest of the galaxy is moving. It's kind of moving backwards. And it just doesn't make sense uh, to why, why would it be doing that? Why is it so much bigger than all the other ones? And why is it moving in a different direction? It can't just reverse direction. So it is commonly understood or believed that this is actually the core of a dwarf galaxy, which at some point in the Milky Way's history, a bit like the Magellanic Clouds we were just talking about, strayed too close to the Milky Way, got sucked in by its gravity. A lot of its stars were either absorbed by us or spat off into interstellar space. And what we look at when we look through the telescope at this is, is quite literally the core of an alien galaxy. And, and I think, we'll guess, I mean, that's a, that's a mind-blowing thing to try and wrap your head around. Uh, and you can really see it. It's so dense through a telescope. Faint, yes, but you can see plenty of stars in there. And again, whether you guys know Captain Star, uh, which is one of the closest stars to the Earth at only about 13 light years away, uh, we've also managed to backtrack Captain Star's motion. And it is thought that that actually originated from Omega Centauri. So one of the closest stars to Earth actually has its origins in an alien galaxy. And I mean, it, it's stuff out of science fiction. It's, it's brilliant. And I get very excited talking about this one. That's one of my favorite things to discuss. I just think the whole thing's mind blowing. Uh, so yeah, if you ever get a chance to have a look at it, do please, I insist. Okay, I mentioned the Argo Navis. I'm moving on to pretty much the last thing I'm gonna mention now, the, the Argo Navis, uh, which is the a giant constellation that the Greeks had in the southern well, it was visible to them, don't forget, because of procession, a lot of things aren't visible to them now. They could see Centaurus, they could see the Southern Cross, but you can't now from the same latitudes because of the procession and the wobble of the Earth. And they also had the Argo Navis, which was this giant ship, uh, which was Jason and the Argonaut ship, which that French astronomer Nicolas de Lacaille split into four more manageable pieces. Uh, Vela the sail, Carina the keel, Puppus the stern, and Pictus the compass, which I didn't actually put on this picture. And it runs all the way from the Southern Cross on the left, and you can see Canis Major there on the right. So it really does take up an enormous amount of sky, and thank goodness it was split into more manageable parts for, for the layman amongst us. Um, but that area of sky is absolutely chocked full of interesting binocular objects and telescopic objects as well as some nice asterisms. You can see the Southern Cross on the far left, and then you can also see, I've, I've drawn them in there, what we call the False Cross and the Diamond Cross uh, as well, which are nice <coughs> ways to sort of help people uh, navigate that area of the sky. And even the Magellanic Clouds uh, are visible on here as well, that uh, eight and nine down here, the Magellanic Cloud and the Tarantula Nebula we just mentioned. So, so this area of sky is fantastic. It's one of the best times of year for us. Um, but the absolute star of the show in this area of sky is the, it's labelled on here as, uh, which one is it? Uh, number two, the green one, the Eta Carina Nebula, uh, which if you guys know anything about Eta Carina is a spectacular area of sky. So again, these are my attempts to capture it on the left with a 200 millimetre lens on the right through the telescope and the, with the Nikon. One on the right is probably my favourite deep space astro photograph that I've got. I nearly fell off the chair when that came, when I looked at that through the, uh, through the camera afterwards. Uh, but on the left there, it gives you a bit of perspective as to just how big it is. And on the right, you can see what we call the Keyhole Nebula, which is that uh, sort of black splodge in the middle. And you can see a sort of a dark shaft underneath it. Uh, looks like a little sort of exploding cloud, if you like. That's the Keyhole Nebula. Uh, and that equates to a very small portion, just that sort of left hand bit at three o'clock on the, the image on the left. It's, it's a zoomed in version of. Um, and what you're looking at there, uh, just under the Keyhole Nebula, is the famous star Eta Carina, uh, which is visible to the naked eye now if you know where to look. But in 1842, 1843, it was the second brightest star in the sky, and it's one of the stars thought most likely to go supernova perhaps in our lifetimes or in the next foreseeable future along with Betelgeuse and Antares. And a bit like Betelgeuse got very, very dim last year because it had a little, I call it a little burp. I don't know, I'm sure that's not the correct terminology, but people seem to understand what I mean. Uh, Eta Carina did the same thing and it had this all, well, a bit more than a burp, so a little bit more than that. We think it used to be a triple star system and two of those stars collided and there was this almighty catastrophic great eruption as it was called um, and that created so much dust and gas uh, after the event where it got very very bright and people thought it might go supernova and then it faded to 
out of uh, naked eye visibility because of all the dust and gas, which has since dissipated a little bit over the last 150 years or so. And we can now, you can now see it with the naked eye if you know where to look. But one of the brightest stars still in the, uh, the, the Milky Way galaxy, considered to be four or five million times brighter than our sun. Um, and yeah, it's a, just that whole area is spectacular to view through binoculars or a telescope and particularly in photography. Uh, that sort of great eruption, you can see that on the left and it can, the, what they call the homunculus nebula, which is surrounding Eta Carina, which is why you can't really see it clearly because you've got these great big lobes of devastation, let's just call it that, of dust and gas created from this uh, impact. Um, and then on the right is, again, one off the internet, but a starless image of the whole Eta Carina region. And right in the center, you can just see that little patch uh, that is that sort of uh, keyhole nebula and Eta Carina. And right up on the top right, actually, you can just see what they call the Gabriella Mistral Nebula, which I've had a crack at, but I'm not really happy with it. And I used to took three 30 second images just to see what it looked like. Something I need to revisit in a few months when the sky is clear. Um, there are plenty of other objects that we have out here which are worth mentioning. There's the Diamond Cluster, the Southern Pleiades, the Wishing Well Cluster. I mean, the list goes on and on, but I felt those were kind of my big five, if you like, of uh, stuff that you should really check out if you come down here. Um, so I think, to be honest, in terms of presentation, I'm going to wrap it up at that just in case of uh, internet problems as well. And there's a whole bunch of pictures you can look at. And if there are any questions, please feel free to fire away. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we'll just give people a few moments to uh, look at your absolutely wonderful images and to uh, formulate their questions. Um, I've, I'm just blown away at the, the quality of your in images, sir. I think you're hiding your light under a bushel. Uh, <laughs> well, thank uh, you very much. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, so I noticed. Uh, on several of the pictures that, uh, and I'm a bit surprised, that you were well wrapped up against the night cold. Is it just because you're acclimatised that it just feels cold? No, not at all. Um, that's a mistake that I myself made when I first came over here. It gets damned cold here in the winter, especially when you're standing around outside. Uh, our winter is very strange. During the, the daytime, it will get up to a, a very pleasant uh, 25, 26 degrees Celsius, but the second the sun drops, the temperature drops down to single figures. Right. Like it can, depending on where you are. We have snow in the interior of this country. There is even a ski resort in South Africa, believe it or not, in the Drakensberg Mountains. It's not open every year. Um, and out in Namibia, and I spent some time in Namibia in the winter there, you're in a desert. and You hit minus figures uh, out there in the winter because there's, there's no cloud cover to insulate the heat. So yes, it, it goes from freezing cold to very pleasant. Summer months we're in now, uh, it's been quite mild because of all the, the cloud cover we've had. But unfortunately, it's just been horribly humid because of all the rain. Summer in this area in the low felt, you know, 42, 43, 44 degrees is normal. Last night, it was still 30 degrees at eight o'clock. Um, that's definite air con weather. Uh, but no, in the winter, which is obviously where I do most of my work, because here in the winter, we. It's quite normal for us not to see a cloud in the sky for six months during the winter months. And it's dry and it's cold, which for the images amongst you would know, uh, that is ideal conditions. It certainly is. Could I ask you to stop sharing your screen now? Sure. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, presentation as much as I have. Uh, and uh, we're looking for questions. So as always, a digital hand if possible. Uh, if not, then uh, wave at me. I do have two screens to look through, so uh, be patient if I don't catch you first time round. So, questions, please. Uh, John Leach. You may have to unmute, John. Yes, okay. Ben, uh, a fascinating talk and uh, lovely to see what you, you, you get uh, where you are. Uh, some beautiful photographs. Uh, I couldn't help but. Uh, search uh, for your name which i've heard before and I, I looked on your facebook pages that your other photography wildlife and well anything and even golf um excellent absolutely excellent i thoroughly enjoyed it 
Thank you. Much appreciated. Always nice to hear. I think we're always our own biggest critic. And I think when you're posting all over Facebook groups and trying to get a bit of a following and you see everybody yeah. else's images, you do yeah. become a little bit uh, paranoid or uh, whatever the right, suppressive of your own stuff. So thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate you're that. You're very welcome. OK, thank you, John. Uh, Tony Morris. Hi, Ben. R really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to observe from the Sutherland Observatory grounds. Uh, and one of the things that always amazes me when you're under a really dark sky is, as you actually said about the dark clouds, how they seem to stand out. It's, it's really missing as soon as you get a little bit of light pollution. I, could, I couldn't agree with you more and, and people are blown away so I've been, I'm so fortunate and I pinch, still pinch myself even though it's been 15 years that I, you know, I get paid to drive people around in an open, or I used to get paid to drive people around in an open safari vehicle looking for amazing animals under dark skies like that and even, sometimes you don't find stuff in the evenings but you just look up and, and people are mesmerised because they have just, they didn't even know it was there. Um, and yeah, because it's so dark, the, the light of the Milky Way becomes so obvious that those black patches are really contrasted against it. And it just gives it this incredible depth. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's until you've seen it, you don't quite grasp it, I think. Yeah. OK, Tony. Yeah, fine. Uh, Jess Robinson. Yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree with Tony. I've, uh, I've spent a couple of months down in South Africa, well, in Uganda and Tanzania and so on, and the sky is, you try and describe it to people and it's unbelievable to, to describe, really, the things that you see. Uh, my question for you was, how do you, uh, you say the temperature range is so vast from the day and the night, do you set your scope up in the daylight and, and let it cool down naturally, or...? Do you have any special process for cooling down your large scope? Because it's it is a fairly big beast, and it's a sort of mirror to cool down, I guess. Yeah, it, it is. Now, unfortunately, it's it's one of the the earlier LX two hundreds. It's not one of the fancy ones. Uh, I got it second hand over here from a guy actually down in Cape Town. Um, so yes, what I would, but you again until you've experienced it, the temperature drops so fast. Uh, it really can drop ten degrees in you know half an hour to an hour. So yes, I normally set it up at sort of twilight um, and I'll give it an hour or so. And when I come back to it, it it's pretty much ambient temperature and it, it is nice and cool, yes. The, the difficult part is in the summer because it just doesn't cool off and trying to, if you do get a, a clear night in the summer uh, and you obviously know very well yourself to try and image when it's 30 degrees and humid outside, you, you know you're not getting the quality that you could get but you play the hand you dealt and you, you're grateful for not having clouds in the summer i suppose but yeah, i have I mean, no specific i mean I, I keep it in a padded box uh, an aluminium box i would love to keep it in a constantly air-conditioned room but I, I don't have one of those unfortunately so i worry for the optics over time but yeah that's that's what i've got <laughs> Do you have a lot of heat escaping from the ground around you? I mean, we, we obviously have light pollution, that's our biggest bugbear in our country, but uh, you know, do you have a lot of heat and distortion through that from the ground? In the summer, yes, although you know, visually it's not really noticeable, uh, but if you are looking sort of directly over a lodge or something uh, where there is plenty of heat and maybe the kitchen's pumping because there's 30 guests all getting amazing food, um, and you know, lights and everything else burning, then yes. But I, I try and do my best when I'm doing imaging or a visual evening to go out. I don't like doing it in the lodge grounds. That rather defeats the point in terms of ambiance for me. I want to take people out of that into the darkness and, and capitalize on what we have here. And, and my last question was, how much protection do you have to carry around with you for astronomy? I mean, our, our, our problem is midges and flies and that's our biggest bugbear you've got lions and other wilderness <laughs> chasing well, down you is that, my is biggest that, enemy is my biggest enemy is probably nonchalance to be honest i've been doing this a long time and i i trust my what we call out we have a word for it in the guiding industry it's situational situational awareness to be able to have a conversation with somebody and still hear a, a branch crack over there at the same time and that does come through practice um, but if i'm out in a big five area then I will always be have the car 
next door and I will always have somebody shining a spotlight once every couple of minutes and we'll even a red spotlight you know it's fine because the animal's eyes still glow under a red light and the other thing I mean don't forget that none of the animals out here want to eat you they generally are afraid of people yes some of the predators are bolder at night time but if you're a group of 10 people making a lot of noise and talking you'd be very 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 unlucky for a pride alliance to think oh somebody just rang the dinner bell I mean thankfully it doesn't work like that they, they generally will avoid that situation. I need to be more careful when I'm on my own, certainly, um, but I will always set up next to the car. That one incident when I had to almost, well, I had to sort of potentially shimmy up a tree from a black rhino. I took a chance and was setting up about 50 meters because I was setting up the star tracker and trying to get a nice dead tree in the foreground. Uh, and I just heard something move in the grass. And again, I've been doing this for a while and I knew that was bigger than an impala or a zebra or something. And I just flicked the head torch on that I was wearing and. I'm, yeah, I'm eyeballing a rhino from about 50 meters away and I had nowhere to go except for this dead tree and it was sort of equidistant between me, my car and the tree and he'd have made mince me to my little car because I've only got a little hatchback. Uh, so I felt the safest option was to be ready to climb the tree if needs be but thankfully he just sort of investigated, turned around and trotted off. I shouted at him and threw a rock at him and he left me alone but yeah I guess that's part of the fun. <laughs> Yeah, whole new set of problems. We just have the local thugs to deal with. But yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> well, there you go. But no, thanks for a great talk. It was uh, it's fabulous to see the southern hemisphere and and some of the interests that are there. So thank you. Pleasure. Glad you've had a chance to see it for yourself. Yeah. So Sometimes I'm looking I'm for uh, more questions. Thank you for that, Jess. I'm looking for more questions. Uh, I'm not seeing any uh, digital hands. Let me have a quick scan through. Uh... Oh, Tony Morris, another digital hand. I'm back again. I was just wondering, Ben, you, you were talking about getting a, a shorter focal length telescope. I mean, for the past few years, these have kind of been all the rage, uh, you know, down three, four, five hundred millimetres. Uh, I, I use a William Optic 71, uh, which, which is yeah. a, a 348 millimetre focal length. And, and I find that works really well with my DSLR. With with light pollution filters over here, yeah. yeah. But you know, it's a nice small package as well. So you find that the smaller packages are easier to set up, <coughs> quicker to set up. So therefore, you kind of use them more. Yeah, I agree. That that LX two hundred is a bit of a beast to carry around, and, and the mount as well. The problem is, you know, I am working on a budget, uh, and I can't afford another mount and a nice refractor. And a, I'm looking at the ZWO 53P, I think, because the, the first light optics have got a special offer where it comes with a IR cut filter and a dual narrowband filter with it for quite a reasonable price. Um, so I was looking at that as a kit to get the, the Gran Turismo 71 and then the, yeah, the, the, the 533 with those two filters and the, the ASI Air Plus. And uh, just to try and be, to be honest, a bit, because of the safety as well, I can then sit in the car and fiddle around on my tablet and do it instead of having to stand out there and take chances and get a bit distracted as well to some extent. I'd love to have a second mount because I still have to set up the mount and align it all properly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just seemed from, from a budget perspective and, and the sorts of things that I wanted to image, that's what I wanted. And then I wanted the camera specifically because I, I'm not giving up the LX200. I want to use both of them and I'll use the LX200 for galaxies and uh, planetary nebulas and things. And I'll use the, the shorter focal length refract refractor for the Andromedas and what the Pleiades and other stuff that I haven't really discovered yet because they're well, well I can't say beyond the reach. Too, they, I've got far too much focal length for it. Bearing in mind, I'm also using a crop sensor DSLR camera as well, which is not designed for astrophotography in the slightest. So yeah, very, very happy with what I've achieved. It's a slow learning curve, but uh, I've kind of got the bug now and yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited to get some new stuff and, and move forward. The, the, the actual reasoning behind it all is because I struggle with big groups because I've only got the one telescope. Uh, and again, when you've only got one eyepiece to look through, it can be quite difficult when you've got a group of 20 people. So what I, what I envisage is having that one set up and then the camera attached to a refractor and have a screen there and be able to allow people to look through the LX200 and that one taking 
real time astrophotographic photo images that can then be displayed on a screen and do a bit more of the, the EAA, the electronically assisted astronomy, uh, just to make it a bit more inclusive for, for groups as well. Okay. Uh, so Ben, uh, if, uh, if I won the lo lottery tomorrow and uh, I fancied a trip to South Africa to do astronomy, so it would be astronomy heavy and wildlife light. Uh, what sort of setup in South Africa is there for that? If you want to combine it with a safari at the same time, if you there are places you can go to in and around the Sutherland area, which is you know a couple of hours outside of Cape Town. There are plenty of guys down there doing well, plenty, but there are a few doing the sort of thing that I'm doing down there. There's just nobody doing it here and capitalizing on the, the Kruger tourism that's coming through here and the, the dark skies and that connection between wildlife and clear skies, which, which I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, but what I was saying, what I was talking about is more of, uh, when I said astronomy heavy, I was thinking about spending most of the night taking data, sleeping in the morning, processing in the afternoon and repeating and then maybe last day go on a go on the the big five safari well then then to be able, that's again something i'm looking to develop is sort of either trips to dark sky areas where you can do a combination of that and if you want to get up early and go on a sunrise game drive you can do or do a sunset game drive and then image during the evening and skip the morning I'm looking at, uh, I'm trying to get lodges on board that will be happy to accommodate me to do that, but it's difficult after the, the last two years, lodges are being a little bit, playing their cards close to their chest in terms of, you know, throwing ideas around and uh, investing in something, should we put it that way? Otherwise, you literally come here, <laughs> the easiest way to do it, and this sounds like a terrible self-punt, but it's not. But if you want to come up here, it would be, give me a ring, I'll organise it for you, and then you just, I will take you into a day drive or a self drive into Kruger National Park because a lot of these lodges that I go to is an all inclusive basis or a, you know, where you stay at the lodge and you do game drive and that's the reason you go. For example, I, went, I can go into Kruger tomorrow in an hour's drive. I can drive through the gate of Kruger, drive myself around Kruger like I did today. I saw four of the big five today and then I leave before sunset and now I'm home again. Right. So it depends on what sort of house. The specific you want you want to do it there's, there's various different ways of doing it okay uh we've got another question ian hargraves yes actually uh paul uh, uh it, you jumped in with more or less the same questions as i was going to ask ben um ben lovely presentation absolutely magnificent photographs and uh as um paul was saying if we wanted to come down and do the 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 big five safari as you know on some days and start uh, uh, observing rather in the evenings on other days um you're saying that you you're setting something up for that to cater for that it's one of the things i'd like to do this year because i've um I believe this is a fairly untapped area and it's nice to give people the opportunity to combine those two and it may be South Africa may not be the first place. Uh, if you're coming on safari, you don't necessarily think about astronomy and vice versa. And yeah. I'd like to, to merge those two things together. So, yeah, I, I have spoken to a couple of lodges about uh, using their property. Guests can come and stay with them. And, and I sort of, lodges are, you know, they're, they're quite protective of their products and they don't like external guides coming in and driving their vehicles on their property. You sort of have to do it through them. But, I'm lucky I've been in the industry for a while. I have a, sound, I sound, I don't want it to sound arrogant, but I have a good reputation here and I know enough lodges over the years where there are a few places that, that will allow me to do that. Um, and I'm sort of chatting with them and we're developing a few ideas. Um, or it can be as simple as you come and you do the lodge thing and I am there as well as your private sky guide. I mean, that's one of the sort of things I, not on my website yet because I haven't quite, figured out the logistics but if i tell my e-brochure as uh, you know where i will if you come to me and say this is what i want to do this is my budget i want to do some wildlife stuff and i want to do 
stargazing and try my hand at astrophotography. This is my budget. I'll say, fantastic, leave it with me, get a quote for you and come back to you. Yes, because one of the big problems, uh, we, um, I'm not actually part of um, uh, Mexborough and Swinton. I'm part of one of their friends groups, which is uh, Mid-Kent Astronomical Society. And we go on safari, not safaris, we, we go on astro holidays. Um, we, we quite frequently go to La Palma in the Canaries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and go up the, the big mountain there by the professional observatories and set up an image from up there. But there's an awful lot of gear to take with you. And trying to get that on a plane uh, and, and undamaged as well, is there, um, are you thinking about having equipment that we could use during the night, if we just brought our own camera down, say, and an adapter or whatever to get onto the back of your telescopes, is that something you're thinking about? Or um, I've, I've thought about it, Ian. I have, I've, I've spoken to a few guys about that. The, the issue is, and it's unfortunate that it comes down to finances, but I'm not in a position where I can go out and buy five telescopes and lug them around the country, obviously. No. But I, I would like to get the, the long exposure photography is perhaps... You know, in the star tracker market, if you will, is a little less specific. And I'm certainly considering getting a, a couple of extra star trackers so I can do, you know, introductory Milky Way shots during our winter. Because we're so like winter here, the Milky Way just comes straight overhead. I mean, it's mm. Venice right above you is Sagittarius and Scorpius. It, it is ideal. Right. Mm. Uh, and just so in passing, that is the dumbbell nebula behind you, I, I assume. Is that is that one of yours? Yes, it is one of mine. That was taken nice. from from England. Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, I've got one of those as well, but it never gets. I think, I think it gets about thirty five degrees. Uh, <laughs> right, but but um, as you as you will see though, there's quite a quite a bit of star bloat in that image, and yeah. that's just due to the atmosphere here. You know, yeah, I mean that was taken. Have to be said that was taken with an eleven inch Celestron SCT. So that's 2,700 millimetre focal length on that. And so... I'm just is. trying to see if I can find mine whilst here. So I've also sort of rather cryptically changed the subject, haven't I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we'll look, come I, back. I, I, your idea is lovely. We'll I have, to, <laughs> we I have to worry back. about the fact that... I also worry about damages as well. And that's a lot yeah. of... And the transportation of it also. Look, in a yeah. perfect world, if you gave me an unlimited budget, yes, I'd go and buy myself a bunch of Dobsonians so I could do big groups for people to look through. I'd have a selection of refractors. I'd also, yeah. I've even looked into a planetarium because what I do is so seasonal to actually build a little planetarium. I'm, I'm looking at VR goggles and ways to try and make this work during the, the cloudier summer months. Mm. Um, so I'm open to suggestion, <laughs> um, but I'm also open to vast investment. <laughs> <laughs> so um just gonna find you, a you you keep mentioning the um better winter months down there and that the yeah. summer months are cloudy has that always been the case or are you noticing it more now with with global warming um no it, it it's standard for our um for, for our climate down here it's just been worse than normal the last couple of years because of the La, La Nina conditions, which yes, maybe in the Pacific, but it still has a knock-on effect over here. We were forecast this year to have a far wetter summer than normal, cloudier summer than normal, and we are having that. It's it, not unexpected. Um, right. So we will, we will hope that it will improve again at some point. Um, but I think it's, it's just the way it is at the moment, unfortunately. So what would be the best months to look at to come down to do some observing under really dark skies and also to take in a big five uh, safari as well? Well, thankfully, uh, the two sort of go together because whilst the bush may not look at its prettiest in the winter, it, most things are dead and therefore visibility is very good. Uh, the animals are under a bit of water pressure because it is also there's pretty much no rain for six months. So they, they have to come to water. You can see far. There's no foliage on the vegetation. So I always say the best time to come on safari is, say, June to September. 
and that just happens to coincide with the best time to do photography in terms of viewing, in terms of conditions. It's planet season for us. The Milky Way is directly overhead. Um, yeah, we've got a plethora of amazing images that we can get. I mean, I, I was taking pictures of, I was actually struggling with the Eagle Nebula last year because it was at, right above my head and the telescope was flopping from one side to the other and couldn't decide where it wanted to go. So I had to come back to it after the sky had moved. Um, you know, so I mean, it's a, <laughs> a first world problem, as I call it. But uh, so, so thankfully, the, the, the two actually kind of go hand in hand. So, Paul, how about uh, um, arranging a MSAS and MCAS trip down to see Ben? I'm not arranging any more trips from experts to International Society. It just raises my blood pressure. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> I've taken them to Spain. I've taken them to Iceland and all and places like that. My blood pressure is under control at the moment and it's going to stay <laughs> that way. Okay, if anybody else wants the task, they're very welcome to carry on. So, uh, Mick Nichols. Uh, yeah, not being uh, very clued up on these things. I was just wondering what the big five was. Uh, in terms of in terms of animals, it's yeah, the yeah. it's it's kind of the we actually don't like it because it's not just about the big five. We actually prefer to say the big five thousand because everything's connected. I'll hop on about that. I'm a guide. That's what I do. Everything's connected in nature. Um, but the the big five stems from the uh, sort of the Europeans who came down here for hunting. Uh, and they are considered to be the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. So that is elephant, used to be just black rhino, but now it's black or white rhino. There are so few of them left, unfortunately, because of poaching. So elephant, rhino, buffalo, then lion and leopard. That's not to do with just size, because a giraffe is much bigger than a lion and leopard. So is a hippo. All right, hippo is a very dangerous animal, but it spends most of the day in water. And if you're going to hunt it, to be quite frank, you just walk up to the side of the lake and shoot it. Uh, it's, not, it's not a dangerous proposition. Bump into one outside of water and you might be in trouble. Um, but yeah, so lion, leopard, elephant, rhino, buffalo, because they are the most dangerous animal or were, are the most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. Well, well, well I must say, I'm not being funny, but when I hear that uh, hunters have been trampled to death in Africa, I actually say well done to the elephant, to be quite honest. <laughs> I do as well. Nick, Nick, I, I don't hunt myself. I have no interest in it. I carry a rifle. I've carried a rifle for 15 years walking with these animals and I've never used it. I've only ever chambered around twice and I've only thought I ever might have to use that rifle once when I had an elephant about five meters away from me who was very unhappy. But it was my own fault. I didn't know he was there. I walked around a tree and pretty much walked into his backside. As you <laughs> can imagine, he, he took offense at that and thankfully we... we we were both so freaked out about it. We both sort of shouted at each other for a little bit and he flapped around and trumpeted and decided, we both decided discretion was the, uh, the better buzz of valor or whatever they say. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah, all joking aside, the, we have a phrase out here which is, there are old guides and there are bold guides and there are very few old bold guides. Because the longer you do this, the more close calls you have, the more people you know who have had run-ins or have been injured or have had to shoot things. And I actually don't walk so much in the bush now with guests because I've got away with, I feel I've got away with it for 15 years and I have never had an incident. And I'm quite happy to keep my clean track record. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've worked Ben really hard tonight. Uh, so... Can we just end the evening by giving a big Mexper and Swinton Astronomical Society? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. A great pleasure. Thank yeah, you, everybody, thank you, for, for joining and for, for sharing interest.